Good morning. I'm Dan Burkhoff from New York City. And we're very, very happy to welcome everyone to the first annual ACURE meeting. We're really grateful that uh, with the, the turnout has, was uh, far exceeded our expectations. Um, we have been uh, meeting as a, a very small working group for the past little over a year. Uh, we brought together um, a, a group of uh, investigators from basic science, clinical science, that are interested in advancing um, our understanding of the, the, ro the potential role in the clinic of myocardial unloading. I think that we are at a place comparable to where um, PCI was uh, 20 or 30 years ago when we recognized that the importance of opening arteries in the setting of acute MI. Um, as we'll hear today in multiple um, talks, um, the understanding of the role of unloading in acute myocardial infarction has been there for several decades. And um, now, I think there's a, a concerted effort, uh, thanks to a lot of the people here in the room, to try to bring this um, into, into clinical practice. So ACURE is a, a working group that um, has been formed, and the mission of the working group is listed here on the slide, which is uh, the goal um, is to advance the science and mechanistic understanding of acute cardiac unloading and supporting the translation of basic and clinical research into therapies aimed at heart muscle recovery. And so the, the theme of the, um, the theme is unloading, myocardial unloading, left ventricular unloading. And so we wanted to start just by putting a, in essence a straw man definition. What is ventricular unloading? Every, every term that we use, of course, needs to have a definition. And this is what we'll start at the beginning of the day, and we'll see where we end up at the end of the day uh, through the discussions. But as, as the starting point, we have considered ventricular unloading is defined as the reduction of the total mechanical energy or power expenditure of the ventricle to minimize myocardial oxygen consumption and also to minimize the hemodynamic forces that lead to ventricular remodeling. So I think these are, are things that we'll hear throughout the day. We'll hear about mechanical work. We'll hear about pressure generation, we'll hear about remodeling, we'll hear about, um, about myocardial preservation, and uh, we will see where we end up at the end of the day. I think at the end we have some, a lot of time for discussion, and I'm sure, for sure we'll revisit some of, these, um, some of these issues. So with that as a basic um, overview, um, one thing I want to just emphasize for the speakers is that the, in order that we stay on time, the last 15 seconds of your allotted time, your slides will jump to the conclusion slide so that we just keep on track. So I think this is more kind than what is at other venues where the, just the slides go black. At least you'll have 15 seconds to sum up. So with that as an overview, I'd like to introduce the chairs for the first uh, session, Dr. Elazar Edelman and Dr. Roger Hajar. Thank you, uh, Dan, and I'll turn this over to Roger in a minute. I have the distinct honor, because of my good friend Dan, uh, to introduce my mentor, Dr. Brownwald. First, I would like to also thank both uh, Abby Ahmed and Mark and Naveen for organizing this extraordinary uh, conference. While I'm grateful to Dan for the introduction that should rightfully be his, I'm also fully conscious of the fact that I have absolutely the most difficult task of the day, and that is introducing a man who will provide the overview of modern cardiology when this man himself embodies modern cardiology. Everybody here knows Dr. Brownwald. Each of you would have a list of his attributes and accomplishments that would be extraordinary in his own right but each of our lists would be different. Some would cite his more than a thousand papers, many of which are citation classics, the number of eponyms, eponymic classifications, signs that bear his name, his magnum opera, Harrison's textbook in medicine, and Brownwald's heart disease. But I suspect that if you were to ask Dr. Brownwald, he would tell us that all these lists were incomplete, and all the awards and accolades and knighthoods and lectureships were meaningless, because they fail to capture the essence of what Dr. Brownwald stands for. 
and that is that he is above all a clinician from the Greek clinikos, being at the patient's bedside, caring for and teaching us how to care for patients by touching and feeling and hearing and being part of the patient. Be that patient as I saw him care for the chairman of multinational corporations or common people whose lives were marked simply by the fact that they were loved by their family. The hospital he built made no distinction with regard to class. Everyone stayed in the same rooms. And if you were to ask Dr. Brownwald of what he was most proud of, he would tell you it was me and all the thousands of me's that he trained. All of us, every one of us in this room who carry him with us. So like all of you, I'm in awe of the man. I'm inspired by his spirit. I'm as intimidated by his intellect, but blessed by having learned from him and will forever consider him to be the embodiment for all we stand for and are proud of. So with the greatest of humility, I'm honored to introduce the history of modern cardiology, Dr. Eugene Brownwell. Uh, and thank you for this extraordinary introduction. Um, I think if we could put a, a 0.25 to it, it might be accurate. <laughs> um, I also want to thank the organizers of this meeting, uh, which should be uh, extremely interesting. Um, what I'd like to tell you is uh, uh, the, the work that my colleagues and I have done a lot of it uh, quite a while ago um, that uh, deals with acute um, myocardial infarction, protection of the ischemic myocardium, and uh, heart failure. These are my relevant disclosures. Um, my talk will be divided really into five sections. Uh, limitation of infarct size, other studies that are relevant to this conference that we've done. And moving into the present and the future, uh, work that we haven't done, uh, but comments that I would make about the epidemiology of AMI and cardiogenic shock, uh, something about the management that uh, you are all interested in, and uh, some comments about future directions. So the journey begins um, 61 years ago when I came to the uh, intramural program of the National Institutes of Health to work at the laboratory of uh, Stanley Sarnoff, uh, who was at that time a renowned cardiovascular physiologist. And what we were interested in is a systematic analysis of the determinants of myocardial oxygen consumption. It's sort of strange that something as fundamental as that really had not been tackled in a systematic way before. And we selected to work with um, an isolated supported heart. Now this heart was in situ, um, and, um, uh, but um, all of its uh, major vessels uh, were tied off and um, the only blood that flowed into the right ventricle was coronary venous blood, which was uh, uh, measured co constantly by a, a rotameter, a primitive um, um, uh, device flow measurement. And uh, the uh, measurement of uh, venous oxygen was made over here. Uh, the aorta went through a stalling resistance. There was a, uh, an, another uh, device to continuously measure a cardiac output that went to a reservoir which returned uh, the blood to a, um, uh, the coronary venous blood was returned to a support dog. Uh, 
um, hooked up, his arterial line was hooked up to this reservoir, which maintained, maintained a, uh, a certain pre-specified level. Well, uh, it's a, a, was at that time a complicated uh, uh, kind of preparation, but um, it allowed continuous measurements. Uh, oxygen consumption was measured continuously because uh, uh, arterial blood and mixed venous coronary sinus blood were measured continuously. And uh, the um, uh, aortic pressure could be modified through the stalling resistance and uh, flow and uh, uh, pressure determined. So, after 11 years, um, this is the summary of the work. Most of the oxygen consumption, um, and we took this preparation and we really moved flow, pressure, uh, left ventricular end diastolic pressure, uh, heart rate all over the map. So we were able to systematically look at this. And we found that there were basically eight determinants of myocardial oxygen consumption. And here are the three biggest. Stress, oops, um, which we measured as um, um, systolic pressure uh, multiplied by radius which was uh, the, really the Laplace principle. Contractility, um, which was related to uh, left ventricular DPDT and heart rate. Less important, but still significant, was basal oxygen consumption, which occurred when there was no contraction with a potassium arrested heart. The uh, cost of depolarization, of activation, the maintenance of an active state and shortening against the load. So these were the major principles. And of course, uh, the focus was on the three big ones. Now, this slide says uh, 1967. And in 1967, I had a, um, a very important experience. I, I went to the University of Rochester uh, to, to be a visiting uh, cardiologist for a couple of days. And um, on the way out, a, um, uh, an assistant professor of surgery, fellow about my age, who later became uh, chairman of that department and a very distinguished um, cl uh, clinical surgeon, showed me uh, his dogs. He had a colony of dogs in cage. Well, he had a room of cages in dogs. And um, they all, he said, these dogs all have hypertension, and the hypertension is being treated. Was being treated with a, um, a pacemaker um, inserted uh, into the usual position in the thorax with um, uh, leads to the carotid sinus nerves. So these dogs who had become hypertensive by a, a peripheral uh, perinephric. Um, cellophane and um, unilateral nephrectomy I had their blood pressures controlled. We were doing studies in our laboratory on the hemodynamics of carotid sinus nerve stimulation. I think you all know them well. And um, in coming home from Rochester in thinking about the fact that these dogs were normotensive, and that this could be regulated from the outside. Um, I reviewed in my mind the fact that um, the carotid sinuses uh, uh, reflexly affect peripheral vascular resistance, heart rate, and contractility. And uh, therefore, their stimulation must reduce myocardial oxygen consumption. I asked uh, my wife, uh, now deceased, Nina, who was the cardiac surgeon, do you think you could implant a um, stimulator uh, on the two carotid sinus nerves and um, safely in patients? She said, no problem. And um, uh, she went into to the uh, autopsy room 
dissected, if you could have his uh, carotid sinuses, put the pacemaker into several dogs, it worked. And within six weeks of my trip to Rochester, she had successfully uh, implanted the first carotid sinus nerve pacemaker. Patient activated it. And um, it was possible thereby to reduce antibacterials, to improve the balance between oxygen demand and supply. And here is an example of a patient with a pacemaker. And you can see that uh, uh, the uh, control mechanism uh, that he wore just below his belt, there is a button that he would press uh, for angina. And then um, it was a radio frequency transmission through the chest. And believe it or not, it worked. It worked quite well. But it, it, it went nowhere because in 1969, um, cabbage surgery was introduced, and that is an, obviously a much superior way of directly improving uh, myocardial oxygenation. However, uh, this particular patient uh, really taught me an extraordinary lesson. We told our patients that if they have prolonged chest pain, they should not activate the stimulator. Or if they did not get relief in two or three minutes, they should stop. And he came in with an evolving um, ST elevation myocardial infarction, and he had the stimulator on. And um, he was admitted to a small coronary care unit, six beds at the clinical center. And um, uh, the team began to take care of him. I walked in and found that the stimulator which I had told him to turn off was on. I turned it off. I came back 15 or 20 minutes later, it was on again. I turned it off again, this happened three times. The patient did well. And when I looked at the electrocardiogram later, I was struck with the fact that every time the stimulator was on, the SD segments were almost isoelectric. Every time I was the smart one who turned the stimulator off, he got ST elevations of about three to four um, millimeters. And every time he turned the stimulator on, he was the smart one, these became isoelectric. So in thinking about this, I was very surprised. It showed that in somebody having a myocardial infarction, um, it was possible to somehow intervene and, and, and change the game, as it were. The preceding notion before this was that um, when a coronary uh, vessel becomes occluded, the death of myocardium is like throwing a light switch and turning it off, that it was a sudden event. And obviously that was naive. It takes heart muscle some time to die, and it all doesn't die simultaneously. So um, we then uh, planned to do a clinical trial. The device was uh, manufactured by a small company at the time, Medtronic, which became a giant. But we then did not go forward because of um, coronary revascularization, which is a much more direct way. So. Uh, but what we did do, it stimulated us to do a series of dog experiments. And um, working with a very good team uh, in uh, 1969 and 70, Peter Morocco was a terrific research fellow. He was, um, uh, a, uh, he was Polish and was, um, uh, had a very good feel for physiology and for experimentation. And we published this paper, uh, and I'll show you a couple of examples, entitled Factors Influencing Infarct Size Following Coronary Occlusion. These are, at first, were all open uh, chest dogs. And um, here's a paper that was part of this, done with uh, Peter Libby, who was a medical student working in the laboratory at the time. And the basic uh, technique was to uh, 
uh, occlude the LAD or a large branch of the LAD. And the points that you see um, on the epicardium where we um, uh, uh, placed uh, epicardial electrodes. And with the occlusion of that vessel, um, measured control, the SD segments went up in the leads that were uh, in the supply of the occluded vessel. We treated the animal with Practolol, a beta blocker at the time, and repeated the occlusion, and the um, area of ischemic injury was much smaller. Now we went further uh, in another series of animals after uh, the um, SD segments were measured and the situation was stable. Um, we sacrificed the dog 24 hours later and obtained uh, biopsies of the myocardium um, in which the SD segment had been measured epicardially and measured the CKMB. And if the CKMB was uh, depressed, that meant the tissue had become necrotic. And uh, this is a summary um, of um, many experiments, and uh, it shows the control experiment without an intervention, that there was a uh, inverse relationship between ST elevation uh, in any lead shown on uh, the abscissa and CK in that tissue. When we intervened uh, pharmacologically with the combination of propranolol and glucose uh, um, and um, uh, potassium, uh, you see that the relationship is much more favorable. There was less ST um, uh, reduction. And with the intervention of reperfusion, there was relatively little myocardial necrosis. So we concluded in patients with myocardial ischemic injury resulting from coronary occlusion, measures designed for reduction of myocardial oxygen demands and improvement of coronary perfusion when affected promptly so time, we felt, was of the essence. After a patient has been brought to a hospital, might reduce the ultimate size of the info. So as far as we know, this was the first uh, um, presentation of an idea of um, infarct size reduction. Now, we couldn't do much with reperfusion, um, and it stood there. Um, until 1976, when Eugene Chazov in Moscow um, published this paper, uh, and it shows reperfusion uh, after coronary thrombolysis. I believe this is the first patient who was successfully treated. You see on the left an occluded right coronary artery before streptokinase, and on the right the uh, uh, patent coronary vessel. So a method became available of um, reperfusion um, promptly. Um, we, we wondered whether this really salvaged myocardium. And in this study that was carried out when we had moved to Boston, we um, observed that uh, with thrombolytic reperfusion, there was a reduction of uptake of thallium um, injected intracoronary um, in, in patients in whom the vessel had been opened. Why was this important? It showed salvage of tissue, but because you need living tissue, viable tissue, in order to take up uh, thallium. So we were encouraged by that. And uh, that led to the establishment by the NIH of the Timmy Study Group in uh, 1985. In 1986, we had completed our first trial 
in which we compared TPA and streptokinase on the uh, patency of occluded coronary vessels, found the superiority of TPA, and then followed the patients for a year and found on the slide, the yellow doesn't show up much, that um, 161 patients who had patency at 90 minutes had a much better prognosis than patients who had an included vessel at 90 minutes. So this um, encouraged us to continue this line of work. Now, I'd like to tell you a little bit about other studies that are relevant to the subject of this conference. The first one was transeptal left atrial puncture, a new technique for the measurement of left atrial pressure in man. And uh, this was led by John Ross, who was a fellow in the cath lab at the time. And um, it is important only because the tandem heart relies on uh, left atrial pressure obtained in this manner. This shows that the catheter and the extruded uh, uh, needle in the left atrium. This is the first patient whom I personally catheterized. It was a patient with mitral regurgitation. And you can see the pullback um, of the um, um, pressure from the left atrium with giant V waves into the right atrium. We went on and developed uh, a technique for measuring left ventricular pressure. And that was done by uh, advancing a catheter over the guide wire and uh, placing it in, in the left ventricle. Now, this technique was widely used in uh, the late 1960s and the early 1970s for left heart pressures. It was, it died once the Seldinger method of uh, a percutaneous um, retrograde arterial uh, pressure measurement uh, through a catheter introduced retrograde into the left ventricle became available. It has had a great renaissance in the last couple of years because of its use in, um, um, in, in patients undergoing electrophysiologic studies with catheters ablating um, foci in the left atrium. And obviously, this approach is central to the tandem heart. Um, we also studied and measured um, left ventricular ejection fraction by introducing radioactive albumin into the left ventricle and measuring the percentage of blood that was ejected with each beat. And um, we said the estimation of the fraction of the left ventricle and diastolic volume that is ejected into the aorta during each cardiac cycle provides information that is fundamental to a hemodynamic analysis of left ventricular function. So the um, um, ejection fraction lives on. Then to move to um, some other studies, uh, this slide shows the effects of um, the first measurement of improvement in outcome in an experimental preparation. This was an experimental pressure in which myocardial function was produced in the rat by tying off the left coronary artery, studies done by the FEFAS. And um, as you can see, uh, in animals which didn't receive infarcts, the controls, the survival was quite good after one year. In the post-MI studies, you can see that there was a sizable reduction in, um, thank you, there was a sizable reduction in, in um, benefit with a marked increase in mortality. And of course, this led us to the um, concept that um, 
uh, of the basic remodeling that occurs in the left ventricle that you're all acquainted with. So this very simplified diagram shows uh, the uh, myocardial function in the top left. Um, you see with the progression of time after the infarct, you see that the infarct um, does not uh, uh, contract, actually expands during, in a passive fashion during diastole. This places a greater burden on the non-infarcted heart, um, which uh, then gradually dilates, and that this is what leads to ventricular failure. Um, the SAFE trial um, showed that pa patients with myocardial infarction um, who had a reduction of ejection fraction um, but with not an overt failure um, showed a uh, significant increase in survival um, with captopril uh, versus placebo. This has been repeated many times. Okay, now to move on to the epidemiology of AMI and cardiogenic shock. We've talked about the past, I want to talk about the present. Here we're looking at uh, a paper that was published uh, just uh, several uh, weeks ago in the new journal, uh, JAMA Cardiology. And um, it is an interesting study because it shows the uh, importance of the atherosclerotic burden in patients with myocardial infarction. And what you can see is uh, patients um, following um, the determination of um, patency that patients with more obstructions when they left the cath lab had a much worse mortality over the course of the next uh, five years than patients who had, had only a single vessel. Now, this was taken um, further by Holland Krampholz and his colleagues um, who obtained information from Medicare and it showed that the Medicare beneficiaries heart failure hospitalization post AMI. So they studied a 12 year period when a lot was happening to the acute of myocardial infarction. Um, and survival after the post AMI operation remains poor. The challenge is still remains for the treatment of the high risk condition following myocardial infarction. And here are two slides. This is heart failure hospitalization following myocardial infarction. And you can see that over the entire period, it showed a trivial decline from about 16% to 14.5%. But perhaps more important is the one year mortality for, for heart failure hospitalizations after AMI. And that has not changed, and that's what the challenge is. And I think that's what you're trying to meet. This is, this is the enemy, 45% uh, mortality after hospitalization. Now here are the uh, trends of uh, patients undergoing PCI. Despite the evolution of medical technology and use of contemporary therapeutic measures, hospital mortality in cardiogenic shock falling myocardial function, who are managed invasively in hospital mortality in did rise. Additional research obviously is uh, indicated to improve outcomes in this high risk field. And um, these are the findings from the Medicare database that shows the mortality at one year of patients who've had uh, discharge from the hospital um, with a uh, history of having an MI with um, um, treated in the hospital, acute MI and cardiogenic shock, who left the hospital. Um, this is uh, uh, also on the same 
subject. And it says that post that hospital survivors of AMI who had cardiogenic shock have higher risk of death and their hospitalization during the year after discharge. So the battle isn't won when the patient leaves the hospital. Although obviously it's important because the mortality of untreated patients we know is 50 to 60 percent. So this is a, an analysis carried out after uh, the patients left the hospital. And you can see that there is about a 30% increase in the blue line, which shows the cardiogenic shock patients after those who did have cardiogenic shock. So despite the fact that these patients were improved sufficiently to leave the hospital, over the first 60 days, they had a 30 to 40% mortality higher than uh, those who ha had not had cardiogenic shock. A few words about management of um, AMI and cardiogenic shock. Um, first of all, is it important to do more than a single vessel um, PCI in patients who have multivessel disease? And the answer is indisputably yes, it is, if you can possibly continue. Uh, this is a trial carried out in London in patients with STEMI and multivessel CAD undergoing infarct PCI, preventive PCI in non-infarct arteries with major stenosis reduced the risk of adverse cardiovascular events as compared with PCI limited to the infarct artery. This was a control trial. This was a randomized trial and it shows the hazard ratio in preventive PCI shown in blue and just culprit vessel PCI shown in red. So the job isn't done if you don't remove all the um, um, obstructions. Intraaortic balloon, of course, has been the old standby. And the old standby hasn't done so well recently. I'm only going to show you one slide because it also comes from a randomized clinical trial. And it shows that time to event curves were the primary endpoint in patients treated medically and treated surgically were equally uh, not uh, treated with an intraaortic balloon were intricately bad. Curves were right on top of each other. And in the first 10 days, there was a 40% mortality. Not so good. Now we come to uh, what can you do about it. Uh, and the impel, the, the impel device obviously has been very important. And what have we learned in, of the impel device in cardiogenic shock? Well, Bill O'Neill, who is here and who will be speaking later, um, did an important uh, registry trial, and I mentioned registry. He uh, studied patients, about 150 patients, who um, uh, received, in a non randomized fashion, either um, impeller flow uh, prior to PCI or after PCI. The argument is, well, you don't want to put that flow on and waste any mi precious minutes. So it's pre-PCI or post-PCI uh, reperfusion better. And he reported very convincingly that early initiation of hemodynamic support to PCI with Impella 2.5 was associated with more complete revascularization and improved survival in the setting of refractory cardiogenic shock. There have been other observations. The Impella 5 also been studied for cardiogenic shock. And uh, what it does is it reduces, it certainly has been shown to uh, improve ejection fraction, which um, is shown before Impella on the right and after impeller on the left. Very impressive reduction of this important factor. Mortality was high. This is 30-day mortality. 
and in patients who had uh, um, cardiogenic shock secondary to um, uh, atherosclerosis and myocardial infarction, you see that the survival was less than 50%. Those who had cardiogenic shock for other reasons did better. Um, here are some data on the tandem hype. So the um, um, ventricular cyst device, the tandem heart, rapidly reversed the hemodynamic compromise seen in patients with severe cardiogenic shock refractory to balloon pulsation and the vasopressin. But again, mortality is not particularly favorable. You see survival in patients who had uh, myocardial infarction in blue and those who had non-ischemic disease in green. The pattern does appear that the cardiogenic shock patients actually do worse. And then finally, I cannot show you anything about the position of uh, people who write the guidelines. But here is a uh, knowledgeable group, and I consider these the present uh, uh, guidelines. It's an expert group that was pulled together, people with experience in the field. And here's what they said. Percutaneous uh, sub mechanical support provides superior hemodynamic support compared to pharmacologic therapy. This is particularly true for the impella and the tandem heart devices. In profound cardiogenic shock, intra-aortic intra balloon to provide benefit um, as opposed to continuous flow pumps include the impella and the tandem heart. So again, they agree that this is superior to the intra-aortic balloon. Early placement, and this is key, of an appropriate support may be considered in patients with cardiogenic shock who fail to stabilize or quickly show improvement after initial intervention. And um, uh, mechanical circulatory support may also be considered for patients undergoing high-risk PCI, even those who don't have um, uh, acute myocardial function. So this brings me to future directions. And I have a couple ideas. First of all, we're not, we, we still have reperfusion injury that occurs and, uh, when PCI is carried out. And um, uh, this is a puzzle that people have been examining for about three decades. And there are some very interesting uh, animal experiments, but they have not been uh, translated to successfully to patients. The second um, future thing I see is reduction of myocardial oxygen demands. There was a very interesting paper paper in the uh, in Jack earlier this year of early beta blockade um, improving uh, um, hemodynamics ejection fraction and infarct size but the key here is early it's got to be given prior to PCI and a phase three trial should be carried out Early treatment with um, the um, uh, sacubitril um, um, arb valsart combination and tristo uh, should be considered because it will help to uh, um, reduce uh, the um, ventricular size and diminish wall stress. And um, I think we should look into the future and think about secondary prevention of recurrent myocardial infarction. And I believe that intensive LDL lowering with CP, PCSK9 inhibitors is going to do the job. And finally, I want to leave you with the concept that earlier application of AMI, um, cardiogenic shock, is integrated. I think it takes a while until a decision is made to apply one of these new devices. And I think it should be done 
much faster, just the same way as we save time with um, P PCI. We need to save time um, with this. There should be prolongation of so-called brief temporary um, cardiac uh, shock treatment because as you see, when the patients left the hospital, they were not ready to leave. They had a 40% mortality that was higher um, in the first 10 post-hospital days. These devices, if they are applied for a longer period, of course, will be bridges to surgically implanted, durable left ventricular assist device, um, and perhaps bilateral biventricular assist devices, bridges to uh, cardiac transplantation, and direct bridges to recovery as well. So I've tried to give you a uh, very prolonged uh, history of uh, my colleagues and myself in this field, and I've tried to give you some ideas for where we go into the future. Thank you for your attention and pardon my hoarseness, which I developed on my flight uh, on it in Air Italia yesterday. Thank you. <laughs>